Don't You Just Wanna Go Ape Shit? by Katjes and Margarita Damon Licks. And that's when I told him, you can shove your grapes and your opinion in the blender. Uraka Cordles, jabbing her chopsticks into her lunchbox triumphantly. She does not notice the chopsticks falling. Ida does, and catches them before they can flip and send rice flying everywhere. I've never seen someone look so horrified in my life. He should have been horrified, Sue says, wrinkling her nose. If you can't respect your things, then you shouldn't be surprised when you protect your own stuff. While I understand the need to establish and respect boundaries, I don't think you should be using such harsh words with our peers, Ida chides, handing the chopsticks back to Uraka. Maybe you can be a bit on the sterner side, but it really isn't necessary to threaten one of our classmates with... with a blender, of all things. No, let her speak. Midoriya sets down his bento. Eyes raise that he points at her, wielding a piece of katsu in his chopsticks. Aren't you tired of being nice? He jokes quotingly. Don't you just want to go ape shit? Everyone's too focused on Ida telling him off for swearing to notice Shoto in the corner of their lunch table, mulling over the words in a bite of cold soba. While he's certain Mineta had it coming for him in this anecdote of Uraraka's, he's also not sure what he would have done in the same position. Todoroki Shoto, son of the great endeavor, being anything less than cold and stoic. Unthinkable. Todoroki Shoto is supposed to be the ideal upper-class son, obedient and loyal to his father, suitably restrained and polite in his mannerisms, and about as interesting as a bowl of white rice. Except, he's not with his father, he realizes. He's in the dorm, among friends. Theoretically, he could eat what he wants, wear what he likes, act as stupid as he pleases, and his father wouldn't even have to know about it unless he does something stupid enough to warrant a call home. His father's even been attempting to redeem himself lately. At this point, Shoto seriously doubts actual consequences will fall on him anymore. If he wants, he doesn't have to stay on a regimented diet. He doesn't have to wear polo shirts and slacks on the casual Friday nights Ashido and Hagakure started. He can be up late binging Netflix, eating cup noodles, and show up to movie night in sweatpants. To be honest, now that he thinks about it, he is tired of being nice. He does want to go ape shit. Shoto has never really lived under a rock. Despite the jokes that Kaminari makes about him being a meme plebeian, the plebeian, Shoto does know what memes are and why they're used. He was never banned from the internet per se. Being digitally illiterate would hinder hero work and Endeavor's masterpiece should know how to use digital interfaces as natively as the past few generations. So, yes, technically he knows things. It's just that for most of his life, he was literally too exhausted at the end of training to do much more than lick his wounds, eat some rice, and sleep. Not getting enough sleep meant sloppy performance the next day, which would result in beatdowns that made him even more exhausted, which meant more sloppy performance. He just couldn't afford a late-night internet binge especially when his wake-up time was at five in the goddamn morning for, you guessed it, more training. On days when his father was out, though, he fondly remembers playing flash games and watching YouTube videos for hours on end, crunching on the shrimp crackers he pilfered from Natsuo's not-so-secret stash. Really, it was only a secret from their father, because he never bothered to check in on Natsuo's room, or Natsuo in general. So Shoto knows what a meme is. He knows, roughly, the differences between Reddit, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and Tumblr. He's familiar with a meme here, some slang there, and just enough pop culture to not look like a complete idiot when he's out with his friends. But he's aware he's missed out on a lot. Now, though? The UA dorms have frankly impressive 5G Wi-Fi speed. Eater attempted to instate a curfew time at the beginning, but he's been whittled down to a meek request for quiet hours, which they all obey anyways. Shoto is free to browse the internet as much as he wants. He looks at his hands. Looks at his laptop. It's three in the afternoon on a Friday, and he has the whole weekend ahead of him, and he's got lightning-fast internet in the privacy of his room. He has all the power in the world to, as Midoriya put it, go apeshit. What the hell, why not? He boots up his laptop and opens a new tap.
Dude, holy shit, did you get any sleep last night? Asked Kaminari on Monday morning in homeroom. Moon's haunted, Shoto says on reflex. What? Moon's haunted, he repeats. Eye bags, Gucci, his brain whispers, sagging in dark. He slumps into a seat like ooze, or like someone who spent their entire weekend doing a sleepless deep dive into the world of internet culture. His laptop whines faintly in protest. He may or may not have roughly 100 tabs open over five windows. He may or may not be running on three hours of sleep. The day has never looked longer. And that's how it all starts. See, the thing about being a stone-cold bitch for the first half of your first year of high school is that it sets expectations about who you are and what you're capable of. To be perfectly honest, Shota doesn't know the answer to either of those questions, but much of his classmates are under the illusion that they at least somewhat know. To most of them, Todoroki is stoic, quiet, and relatively studious. He seems like the kind of person who would describe doing taxes as necessary and intellectually stimulating. His resting poker face portrays no awkwardness, confusion, or levity in class. This means that every time he memes, it's like a bomb going off. On Tuesday evening, he walks back into the common room from a walk around the grounds to find Mineta wrapped in Sarah's tape like the world's ugliest little maggot, squirming against the couch. Shoto steps back, briefly repulsed by the wriggling abomination, before continuing on his way to the elevators. Sarah's usually smiling face is turned down into a frown. Ashido stands in front of the couch, fuming. She's wielding a golf club, which is weird, because no one in his class plays golf. Yayozuru is whistling in the corner, reading a textbook upside down. Definitely no relation here. Ashido taps the club against the ground, threateningly. You little rat piss, baby, she growls, through clenched teeth. This is the last damn time. She hefts the club. Mineta makes an aborted squealing sound. Stay out of my room. No, wait, snivels Mineta. <laughs> Thwack. In the ensuing silence, with only Ashido's heavy breathing as ambience, Shoto has a horrible idea. He leans forward and says, very quietly, they did surgery on a grape. There's a beat of silence. Yaoyozuru stares. Saru stares. Ashido stares. Yaoyozuru leans forward and buries her face in the textbook, shoulders shaking with laughter. Saru and Ashido start screaming, alternating between pointing at Saru and holding their heads as they lose their minds. Shoto ascends up the elevator without so much of a crack in his deadpan expression. Once he's safely in const in his dorm room, he smiles. Shoto startles awake, a phantom burning across his neck. He's, he's late for training. Get up. Get up! He registers the difference in the shape of his room. The dawn light is coming in the wrong way. The ice across his pillow from his nightmare. The all-might alarm clock that Midoriya let him borrow. The unfamiliar softness of the Pusheen plushie he bought at the convenience store, under his sweaty cheek. The digits on the screen, held between All Might's clock-sculpted plastic arms, reads an unforgiving 5am. Shit, he says. Fuck. He kinda wants to roll over and sleep some more, but by the time he's steamed the ice out of his pillow, He's already too wired to do anything but get up and maybe get some exercise done. Old habits die hard, he supposes. He changes into exercise clothes, exits his room, and takes the elevator down to the ground floor. As he quietly exits into the common area, Shoto spots Kaminari on the couch, completely engrossed in his game of Animal Crossing on his Switch. He'd bet good money that Kaminari stayed up all night playing. The other boy's face is slack with the kind of concentration that only a true gamer is capable of. He hasn't noticed Shoto. He's completely vulnerable. Shoto checks over his shoulder fervently. The hallways are otherwise deserted and dim. Perfect. 
He assumes a tea pose and carefully blows a cold jet of air towards Kamenari's face. His victim's nose wrinkles as tiny bits of snow brush against him. Kamenari looks up, fucking screeches at the sight of Shoto staring at him in the dark like the world's most terrifying Bethesda glitch, and falls off the couch. By the time Kamenari's back up again, Shoto has disappeared outside. He can faintly hear Bakugo setting off explosions and yelling at Kaminari for waking him up, and then the rest of the dorm lights up as everyone yells at Bakugo for being louder than Kaminari. Chaos reigns. Shoto runs just out of earshot and then fucking loses it laughing on the quad. It's quite a beautiful morning. He sets out an uneven pace jog around the grounds as the sun slowly rises. Sue's late. Uraka says, squeezing her way past Shoji in the doorframe and wading through the classroom to unceremoniously dump all her textbooks on the desk. She's usually here before me. What happened? Maybe she slept in, Shoda suggests from the other side of the room. Or she could be stuck. All traffic sucks right now. Uraka's eyes go wide and she deflates like a balloon over the nearest platform. Oh my poor Sue! Crushed in traffic, she wails, hand pressed to her forehead like a damsel in distress. The horror, the horror. How ever will I live without her? First, you could remove yourself from my desk. You have a chair, Uraka. Please make use of it. Whoops. Sorry, Ida. I could go look for her, Shoto offers. Two heads are better than one. Uraka looks at him slyly. Oh, please. Like you'd ever move from where you are right now, given the choice. From one desk over, Bakugo scowls and turns. Don't fucking encourage him, he yells. His words are met with a raspberry from Uraka. Get him back to his own desk where I don't have to see him mooning over shitty Deku. It's not my fault he stole my jacket and fell asleep on it. That has nothing to do with you running your hands through his hair half and off. Just take your fucking jacket back and go. Shoto shrugs. Uraka blows a raspberry at him too. He very courageously does not blow one back at her. I'll go find Sue, he says. And if I don't find her, I'll grab a drink and come back. And prove you both wrong, he thinks. And very courageously does not say that. Ignoring the fact that Midoriya is blatantly awake and is struggling to muffle his laughter into Shoto's jacket, Shoto peels himself off the wall and has to practically rip his hand off Midoriya's nest of soft, warm, precious curls. Even if he doesn't find Suyu in the rush hour hallway, he definitely needs a drink. His mouth has gone dry for many reasons that he cannot specify. He opens the door, and, oh, hey, there's Suyu. One hand raised already to push it open. Suyu, he says cordially, greeting her open palm with a high five. She looks stricken at the action. Oh shit, what up? If Kaminari and Ko fall out of their seats in various degrees of hysterics in the wake of his exit, he pretends to give it no notice. Shoto walks into the kitchen for a glass of water at a bleary-eyed three in the morning and is confronted with an eldritch horror. It's too fucking early for this, he thinks. Saro and Ashido, with eye bags to rival Shoto's own, uh, sculpting. Something? Out of a frankly horrifying greyish clear smudge on the table, giggling deliriously. They haven't noticed him enter. Shoto watches in mute horror as Sero shoots tape and Ashido melts it with her acid to make more of what he now recognises as tape sludge. Ashido puts a finger into the largest blob on the table. Two pokes and a swipe form a happy face, which immediately sags into a ghoulish scream of terror. Without conscious input, Shoto says, Do you think God stays in heaven because he too lives in fear of what he has created? Sarah and Ashido both startle and stare at him. Shoto walks back out in response, water forgotten entirely, as Sarah and Ashido gibber at his retreating back. From Dumpster Fire, Piece of Shit, Sperm Donor, 
XXX, XXX dash, XXX. Friday, July 26, 2 XXX. 6 p.m. Schroeder, I have received an invitation as a guest of honor to this year's Valo Gala. 6 p.m. You will be attending with me. 6.01 p.m. Wear something suitable for the occasion. 9.39 p.m. Stop leaving me on red. Red at 10.59 p.m. Saturday, July 7th, 2XXX. 8.07 a.m. Missed call from dumpster piece of shit sperm donor. 8.16 a.m. Missed call from dumpster piece of shit sperm donor. 8.31 a.m. Missed call from dumpster fire piece of shit sperm donor. Shoto pinches the bridge of his nose and sighs deeply. It's not that he hates galas. They're boring, but ultimately they've always ended up as reprised from training, particularly if Endeavor had too much to drink. Then he gets two days off. It's slightly more annoying since he's living in the dorms, but it's not that big of a deal. Mostly, it's just his own spite rearing up again. Toto Shodoroki is self-aware enough to recognize that he's a petty bitch. The only real consequence of the gala is that Shodo has to find something appropriate to wear. The last gala he went to was a few years ago, because the one thing Endeavor hates more than All Might is public appearances. None of Shodo's old formal clothes would fit. He opens his closet and... Whoa. He didn't even know he owned that many tracksuits. All his casual clothes are folded neatly into one drawer consisting mostly of polo shirts in muted, respectable colours, and proper black slacks that were picked out by a stylist. A single rumpled blazer lies in a heap at the bottom of the closet, missing a hanger and looking rather sad. One of the buttons is loose. The pocket seams haven't even been unpicked. Yes, I can iron the creases out of your blazer. Ayama huffs, when Shoto finally swallows his pride and asks for help. But you are not wearing this monstrosity to a hero gala. What's wrong with it? Mon Dieu, this is a travesty against God, man and animal alike. Aoyama shakes out the fabric. It does not look any more like a blazer. This is a mockery of haute couture, designed to pacify the elite and nothing else. Look at it. The shoulders are coming apart at the seams. The fabric is almost certainly polyester, and the whole piece is just utterly, irreconcilably drab. He drops the blazer to clutch desperately at Shoto's collar. Promise me this, mon ami. Whatever you intend to wear to this, do not. You have tout le monde at your disposal. Choose something that compliments, or at least highlights that pretty head of yours. Even a garbage bag would suit you better than this failure of a blazer. Thank you, Shoto manages. Please let go of me. Unfortunately... This means that the entirety of his closet has been deemed inappropriate for the gala. He conveys this over to Kaminari over breakfast, including Aoyama's commentary. And then he threw the whole thing out and went back to his own room, he recalls. I think he was crying. Kaminari, on the other hand, looks like he's chewing both on his toast and Shoto's story all at once, and washing it down with a glass of milk and chaos. What would happen if you wore a garbage bag to the gala? Shoto thinks about it. My father would be upset, he says, and reconsiders. I would not be. Okay, so here's what I'm thinking, Kaminari says, leaning across the table. I think you should wear something that you enjoy, and that will also piss off your dad. Two birds, one stone. I don't really think I have anything like that. Unless you think unending polo shirts are actually my style. Wait, they're not? No, my father hired a stylist to pick them out, but I'm not going to waste them by throwing them in the trash. They're decent shirts. Kaminari makes a face. Yeah, but you own, like, maybe five polo t-shirts, and I think some turtlenecks? I think the only thing you have a lot of is tracksuits for training. So what are you saying? I'm saying that what you really need is a shopping trip. He brightens up. Yeah, I can bring Mina, because Mina has good taste in fashion, and you can bring Midoriya, and you can hold hands, and walk around the mall, and- Hey, I'm just saying! 
Please stop saying things. We're not dating. Kaminari has already whipped out his phone. Shoto spots Mina, followed by several sparkling emojis at the top. Kaminari's texting speed is not one known to mere mortals. His gamer thumbs are too powerful for Shoto to fathom. Okay, it's done. Mina's coming with us on the... Kaminari gestures at Shoto. The 14th. Right, the 14th. Mina will text you the details later. She says she's picking out a thrift store right now. Oh, and Kirishima's coming too. I already texted your boo. He's absolutely down for it, and he needs a new shirt anyway, since his last one ripped in training. Shoto remembers that. He remembers that very vividly. Anyways. My boo? Like, Midoriya. Your sweetie pie, your stud muffin. Please stop saying things. I already know what boo means. I was just judging your word choice. Kaminari squints up at him. Then his face slowly blooms with outraged recognition. So I wasn't hallucinating you T-posing at me? Shoda remains impassive. I have no idea what you're talking about. Yes, you do! No, I don't. Shoda gets up to do his dishes. Kaminari abandons his toast and continues to bother him. It makes sense now! Moon's haunted. I thought it was just a coincidence from you being sleep-deprived, you know. But this? Oh shit, what up? The T-posing? Boo? It all makes sense now! Mina wasn't kidding! You're a man of culture! No, I'm not. Don't you pull that shit with me! I've connected the two dots! You didn't connect shit. Shoto replies automatically. And then curses. I've connected them! Kaminari screeches triumphantly, pointing a damning finger at him. And this is how Todoroki Shoto becomes friends with Kaminari Denki. TNT is not a personality trait. XXX, XXX dash XXX. Monday, July 9th, 2 XXX. Bakugo, 8.56 p.m. Blank. Todoroki Shoto sent YouTube link. 8.59 p.m. The fuck is this, Icy Hot? 9 p.m. Fuck you and your mother! 9 p.m. I will kill you and piss so hard on your smoking corpse, your ancestors will get wet through osmosis enabled by my sheer fury. 9.04 p.m. Okay, Boomer. Red at 9.04 p.m. He can hear the faint sound of someone screaming very loudly from upstairs, and the faint sound of someone running very quickly down the stairs. Both sounds are getting louder. Shoto flips upright from his seat with practice grace and sprints out the front door just before Bakugo blazes into the room and how it impacts the couch. Todoroki! Over here! He spots Ashido's pink arms waving frantically from the entrance to the thrift store. He crosses the parking lot to join her and their friends. On the sidewalk, Kaminari is fiddling on his phone, charger in his mouth. Kirishima is talking to Midoriya, who looks up and gives him a sunny smile and a wave to match. Oh no. He's wearing a tank top. Those godlike biceps are on full display. He can even see the outline of his pecs stretching the All Might screen print. He tears his eyes away and pulls his poker face back into place, studiously ignoring Ashido's knowing expression. Hello everyone. He manages. Shall we go inside? Ashido nods brightly. All right, boys, let's get down to business. As they leave through the men's section, Todoroki asks, Are you sure that a thrift store is a good place to get clothes for a hero gala? He picks up a dress shirt in muted olive green and starts checking the tags. Well, for one, it's cheap. There's a lot of hidden gems among all of these. Ashido gestures to the racks and racks of clothing. Just because it's a thrift store doesn't mean you can't find quality clothes. It's about knowing how to look. She taps the side of her head. Kaminari chimes in. Plus, it would piss your father off even more if he knew you weren't wearing some Gucci bullshit to the red carpet while looking sick as hell. Kirishima shrugs. I'm just here to look for a tank top, but more power to you, bro. Me too. Well, I'm looking for another shirt, not a tank top. But you get my point. Midoriya rambles. God. His dimples are so cute. Either way, 
Midoriya smiles widely up at him. I also wanted to come and hang out with you. We haven't had much of a chance to hang out outside of the dorms, so this sounded really nice. Todoroki feels very strange, like someone fills his chest cavity with fluttering light. It is, with you here, he says. And then he wants to slap himself. It's true, but he shouldn't have said it. Why did he say it? Midoriya's eyes widen. Uh, oh, uh, it, it's the same for me. With me. With you here, I mean. It's nice. Some of the nerves seem to leave his friend, and Midoriya smiles warmly at Shoto. I like spending time with you. Shoto does his best to smile back just as warmly. He knows he must look dumb as hell, but he gives it his best shot. Oi, Todoroki, that shirt's falling off the hanger, Kalmanari says. He breaks eye contact with Midoriya and looks down at the shirt that's now on the floor. The hanger is empty in his nerveless grip. Oh. Are you okay, Todoroki? Midoriya says, genuinely concerned. Yes. He blinks down at the shirt and then dusts it off to sling it back on the hanger. Moving on from what he is well aware was a disastrously gay moment... He smiles once more at Midoriya, and moves onwards to other acts once he sees the worry disappear from Midoriya's face. Kirishima waves him over. Hey, I think you might find something worthwhile in the patterned shirt section. Super manly pickings over here. Shoto considers the options laid out in front of him. Hmm. There are a lot of colors to choose from. I don't know what would look best. I don't know, man. You look good in most colors, Kirishima says holding up a plain checkered shirt. But if you're not sure, there's always the fitting rooms in the back. I think they've got a limit on the number of items you can bring in, though. Good to know. This is when Shoto, rifling through the size mediums, spots the shirt. In this one moment, Shoto becomes impermeable to every change in the world. Time grinds to a screeching halt as he takes hanger and fabric in his battle-worn hands. The pain of the past falls behind him, like the shed skin of a snake, as the wings of freedom unfurl on his back. Every click of the button sends another planet into retrocade, cascading down the cosmos and out to heaven. The stars descend upon him in the High Council of Elders, each asking the same question. What will you do? The power is his. The shirt, as it rests between his hands, is absolutely garish. Shoto briefly remembers that one time he went bowling with the rest of 1A. The shirt is alarmingly reminiscent of the carpet of the bowling alley, all shitty neon planets on a navy blue ripple of sky. The planets look like clip art. The squiggles look like they were scribbled on in highlighter, in the way small children do when they try and draw unicorns. In Aoyama's words, It is a travesty against God. Men and animal alike. Shoto loves it. I think I'm going to try this on, he says out loud, knowing that Kirishima is too and deeply grossed in his own search to see just how fucking awful the shirt is. He gets an enthusiastic mumble in reply, and has to practically restrain himself from making an immediate beeline for the fitting rooms. The staff member on duty at the fitting rooms is worse eye bags than Aizawa sensei, but gives him a weary smile nonetheless. Just the one? Yes, please. Sheltered inside the tiny fitting room, Shoto feels like he's struck gold. The shirt is a perfect fit. When he turns around to face himself in the mirror, half the button still undone, he has to muffle his laughter into his hand. Wonder of wonders, the shirt looks even more like the bowling alley carpet print when it's hanging limp and half unbuttoned off his shoulders. It's absolutely fucking awful. Hey, Todoroki! Show us what you're trying on! Kaminari hoots from outside. The sound of Midoriya frantically telling him, No, don't pressure him. What if he doesn't like what he's wearing? Tells Shoto that this whole shopping trip was brutally planned against him from the beginning. Still, they need to see the shirt. Which means, it's over. And Shoto has the high ground. He opens the door, strikes a pose worthy of the shirt. Kaminari falls over laughing. Kirishima's eyes glow with admiration as he whispers, So manly.
at the print. Ashida looks like she's about to screech with glee. Midoriya has his hands over his mouth. His eyes are misty. The staff attendant, to their credit, does not call security or management on them. Okay, okay, is it just me, or does Todoroki have an unfair advantage? Kaminari finally manages. Like, bro, you don't look bad in anything. Not even this hell shirt. This is the shirt, and you will treat it with respect, Shoto tells his friends. Capitals and all. It is awful, and I salute you for having the sheer fucking guts to wear it. Kaminari wipes away a tear. All hail the shirt! May its days be immensely numbered, so that you never have to wear it anywhere, much less a hero gala. And, oh no. Midoriya's doing that thing where he squishes his lips together, that makes Shoto's heart hammer in his chest. The thing he does when he's mildly offended, but is far too good-natured to really say anything about it. You could absolutely wear that to a hero gala, he argues. And Shoto is absolutely gone for this boy. You look great in it, Todoroki. I think you'll outshine everyone on the red carpet in it. I think he'd think you'd look good in any outfit, Kaminari mutters under his breath. Shoto glares at him. That print is so god-awfully perfect. Ashido shrieks. Kirishima nods vigorously in agreement. Shoto is reminded that although Kaminari claimed that Ashido has a good fashion sense, she goes feral for prints and neons. You're gonna need better pants than those, though, Midoriya says. Dark pants with a dark shirt is boring. You need lighter pants. Something that matches one of the accent colors. Shoto is surrounded by enablers, and he's living for it. Kaminari finally picks himself up off the ground. Okay, okay. I see we're embracing the chaotic energy fully. Are you ready to out yourself as a meme lord on the red carpet, Todoroki? Are you? Somehow, he executes a flawless gendo pose, despite there being no desk in sight. Kaminari. Shoto stares him dead in the eye and raises a single eyebrow. You know me. I'm a man of culture. Kaminari's face splits into a wide, manic grin. They find themselves being dragged around the store by Kaminari as he takes the helm. Ashido is snatching piles upon piles of neon and patterned clothes to add to the consideration pile. Shoda debates the merits of leopard print versus zebra print with a completely earnest, fashion-blind Midoriya and an equally earnest, fashion-blind Kirishima. They settle on a pair of hideous orange bell-bottom jeans, that match the neon orange planets on the shirt. A jean jacket that has coolest hot stuff ever embroidered on the back, and the clear and spin clout goggles. Jean jacket might clash with the fit. Ashido's eyebrows furrow as she taps her pursed lips in consideration. At least color coordinate it. No, I'm still getting it, Shoda decides. It's on Endeavor's credit card, and I can wear it another time. Yeah, you'll look great in it. Midoriya says, because he's the physical embodiment of all good things on earth, despite having a fashion sense in the negatives. I think the print really makes it pop. Todoroki looks to Kaminari. We have to go shopping together again sometime. Kaminari nods seriously. Comrade? Comrade. They bump fists. Kirishima is briefly brought to tears at the manly expression of friendship. Privately, Shoto is intensely grateful that Kaminari and the others have taken his vendetta against his father in stride, without prying. Most of the class understands he's not on great terms with his father, and he treasures their quiet discretion. Oh, but one more thing. Kaminari rubs his hands together in glee. They find them whisked away once more, this time to the shoes section. Shoes? asks Ashido. He already has sneakers. Not just any shoes. Kaminari rumbles around the clearance brim. Crocs. Why do I need Crocs specifically? What do you mean? They're the manliest shoe. Kirishima is right. Modern problems need modern solutions, and your ball gown is yet to be complete. Kaminari preaches. I'll make a Cinderella out of you, my good dude. Shoto raises an eyebrow. With Crocs. Not just any Crocs. Finally finding what he was looking for, 
Kaminari triumphantly hoists the spoils from the clearance bin. Consider me your fairy godmother, he declares, dangling the terrible, horrible, lightning McQueen crocs from two fingers. Because I just found your glass slipper. Isn't that Prince Charming's job? Kaminari mutters to him. Ugh, I'm not fighting Midoriya for that title. He ducks from Shoto's half-hearted punch and grins. Besides, these bad boys are going to get you places on the red carpet, and I'm not talking about walking. He flips the crocs around, and Shoto's eyebrows shoot up to his forehead. ka he whispers appreciatively. The limousine arrives at precisely six in the evening. Shoto climbs in the back before the chauffeur can open the door for him. The chauffeur is definitely not paid to make comments about Shoto's glorious outfit, and only says a quiet, Have a wonderful evening, young master, as he opens the door at their final destination. The cameras flash at the lineup of limousines, as impeccably dressed heroes exit onto the red carpet. Shoto cracks his knuckles and smiles a fraction of an inch. Showtime. Good morning, Aoyama, says Momo, passing through the living room. Her classmate is staring at the TV with deadly resolve, something he only ever does over fashion magazines, usually. Ah, oh, but tonight's the Valor Gala, and Momo's been to enough galas herself to know that the red carpet is the main event of the night. Are you watching tonight's red carpet broadcast? But of course, my Shuri. It is an inspiration to myself and to aspiring designers everywhere. He gestures widely with a pen and a pencil. Mamma was amused but not surprised to see a sketchbook already filled with penciled croquis and scribbled notes. And to think our own classmate is going to make an appearance. Oh, yes, Todoroki's going to be there, isn't he? Mamma offers a smile, though she has a sneaking suspicion that it will not last. I'll join you in a second. There's still plenty of both milk and cream in the fridge. Though after a split-second decision, Momo takes the milk. Someone made a kettle of hot water and forgot about it, but with a press of a button, the kettle's rumbling to life again. Momo pulls honey from the pantry, and a spoon from the drawer, and a mug from the communal rack, doubles back for a pinch of cinnamon, and waits for the water to boil. Someone descends the stairs with a rhythmic lack of grace, and then Kyoko's pulling her mug from the rack, and leaning up to press a kiss to Momo's cheek. Make me one too, Mo? Momo just laughs and tips the honey bottle into her mug. I'm going to be watching the Vala Gala with Aoyama later. Kyoka makes a cute little confused sound. For the red carpet, Todoroki is going to be there. Oh. Kyoka lights up instantly. A little too much, even. Oh. Oh. You know, I think I might join you for this. This is a deeply troubling statement to Momo, who was enlisted by Todoroki just two days ago to make him some hideous neon planet buttons in his own words. This is also deeply troubling because it implies that her girlfriend, girlfriend, knows more about whatever's about to be aired on national television than she does. Momo loves Kyoko, she really does, but Kyoko can be a gleeful shit starter, and Momo knows that. The kettle whistles. Momo fills both their mugs up halfway, and tops off the rest with milk. Kyoka takes a sip, and pronounces it the perfect temperature, which fills Momo with more pride than it probably should. They move back to the common room, where Kyoka exchanges minimal pleasantries with Aoyama, still engrossed in the gala, before immediately entangling herself into Momo's lap. And here we have Miriko, the rabbit hero, decked out in what appears to be a huge lab coat. Oh my! Uh, Miriko-san, a moment of your time. On screen, Miriko turns with a painted smirk, shucking off the coat to a waiting assistant. Ladies and gentlemen, friends at home, are you seeing this? Her dress is positively stunning. It's made of glowing cubes lined in microchips, and seems to shift mechanically with every move. The camera zooms in to show the sliding pieces affixed to the underskirt, cleverly placed like puzzle pieces so minimal fabric shows through. She blows a kiss into the crowd of reporters. The camera flashes go wild. Aoyama goes ham on his sketchbook. It's great to be here, Miriko says, 
The energy's great, the food's great, and I get to see all my friends and co-workers dressed in ridiculous things. You're certainly not dressed in anything ridiculous, the reporter caudles. Except maybe ridiculously beautiful. Please, tell us, Maruko-san, who were you wearing tonight? Aris van Herpen, of course. I absolutely love last year's collection, and I knew I had to... Unexpectedly, a blur moves in front of the camera. One of the crew's shaggy microphones appears briefly in the shot, as the camera interacts the unexpected movement. Miriko and the reporter are both staring, one in glee and the other in confusion, as the mysterious blur slows and resolves itself. First, red and white hair split on each side. A devastatingly handsome face, height and wiry hero in training musculature, and on this nearly model-like form, the world's most eye-searing outfit. A hideous shirt that looks like it was lifted straight from a bowling alley's carpet, neon orange bell button jeans, clout goggles, and what appears to be Lightning McQueen Crocs. Crocs, which are most undoubtedly doing double time as Heelys. Aoyama's pencil clatters to the floor. Mon Dieu, he whimpers. It's worse than I could have ever imagined. Kyoko's not nearly so reserved. Momo has to set both their mugs aside before they spill over from laughter, and briefly wonders why she agreed to watch this inevitable train wreck. The chaotic lordling slows to a stop in the middle of the carpet, appears to disengage the wheels, and breaks down into a flawless fortnight default dance. At the end of it, with his arms crossed triumphantly, Speed, he says. I am speed. Todoroki Shoto, Miriko says, in the exact same tone that Kyoko had used earlier. It's great to see you here tonight. You look fantastic, might I say. She's grinning with manic glee. Oh, uh, yes, the reporter says, pained. Todoroki-san, I'm sure that as the son of the current number one, you must have uh, connections to the world of high fashion. In the eternal words of Yves Saint Laurent, fashion comes and goes, Todoroki says, hand on hips. Style is eternal. Yes, yes, of course. At this point, the reporter sounded close to exploding. And might I ask who you're wearing tonight? With one delicate, poised hands, his nails are painted in varying shades of dollar store polish. He tilts the clout goggles down to peer directly into the camera like he's on the office. Value village, he says, punctuating his sentence with a dab before healing out of frame. Momo tears her eyes away from the screen to watch Aoyama crumble to the floor in a dead faint. For hours after the gala, Todoroki Enji lies in bed awake unable to differentiate where Shoto's god-awful outfit ended and where the wine-induced hallucinations began. No, he reasons. The fucking outfit was real. That was the reason he drank so much wine to begin with. Briefly, he considers calling Ray and begging forgiveness. Japan Trends Number 1. Trending Todoroki Shoto Trending with hashtag Valagala. Number two, Heroes Trending. Endeavor, 92.5k tweets. Number three, Trending. Value Village, 102k tweets. Profile, Terminal Stupid Disease, at Freezerburn. Worm off the string, UA Heroics, he slash him. Japan. Join July 2XXX. 528 following, 7.2k followers. Followed by Danky, Bernhard and Quark, and 17 others you follow. Pin tweet. Terminal stupid disease, at Freezer Burn, August 12th. A video of Todoroki Shoto, camera on the ground. He's sitting down with his bare left leg out, doing a peace sign while staring at the camera. An egg is slowly but surely frying on his calf. He's wearing neon yellow shutter shades, salmon shorts, a turquoise sportswear tank top, a denim jacket, and a navy baseball cap that says bitch 
on it in sparkling hot pink glitter. Faintly, Denki Kaminari's voice says, Hey, wait, isn't your leg hair gonna be inside the egg? Todoroki makes a wheezing sound as the phone camera falls to the ground and the video cuts out. Terminal stupid disease at freezer burn, one hour ago. Locals be hating, but I only have eyes for Ed Shot's edge cake. Starry eye emoji. A fan cam of Ed Shot defeating a villain. Terminal stupid disease, freezer burn, 39 minutes ago. The joke is that he has no cake. His ass is always flat because of his quirk. Flat Stanley. Terminal stupid disease, 12 minutes ago. Do you think Flat Stanley has a flat dick? Terminal stupid disease, at freezer burn, 11 minutes ago. Holy shit, Stanley. It's been there the whole time. That's why Hero Stan Twitter loves Edshot so much. A meme from BuzzFeed Unsold. Shane, I've connected the two dots. Ryan, you didn't connect shit. Shane, I've connected them. What did you think of today's lesson? Shoto chews on his boba pensively. It was different, he says. I thought there would be more hands-on components to testing the limits of our quirk. Midoriya cracks a small smile around his straw. You have to theorize before you do any practical testing, he insists earnestly. Otherwise, you might just hurt yourself in the process. They're sequestered away into the corner table at Midoriya's favorite bubble tea shop, hidden to all but the succulents that line the table and each other. They'd invited Ida, Uraka, and Suyu at them, but all three had bowed out in rapid succession. Shoto had been too busy thinking about the way Midori's freckles crinkled when he laughs to realize that they'd effectively set the two of them up on a totally platonic date. He'd expected Uraka and Suyu, but Ida too? Man, he must really be a disaster if even Ida is getting in on the scheming. It's the theorizing that really gives me trouble. Shoda sucks another tapioca pearl through the straw before continuing. I'm not nearly as creative as you when it comes to the application of quirks. I just know how to hit good, pretty much. Which is all his father ever really cared about. Brute force, brute speed. You really have to stop underestimating yourself. Midoriya reaches over and brutes Shoto on the nose, experimentally. And when his hand withdraws, he's almost as red as Shoto feels. I'm sure you're plenty creative. You just have to have confidence and faith in yourself. I mean, remember when you trended on Twitter for like three days? That was because of your creativity. That was because of the shirt. It was because you were creative enough to wear the shirt to a gala. Midoriya amends. I mean, I've got tons of notes if you want to look into alternative combat applications. But really, with something as versatile as your quirk, it shouldn't be hard to come up with some practical uses. Shoto leans forward on the table and props his chin up on one hand. The last person he saw do this was Yao Yozuru, who was then promptly kissed by Jiro, while the rest of them had to avert their eyes at light speed. Surprise me. To his credit, Midoriya does. He grabs Shoto's free hand, turns it palms up, and taps his fingers twice. Shoto obediently activates his quirk, forming frost across his palm and down onto the table. There's one, Midoriya says triumphantly placing his bubble teacup in Shoto's hand. Effective heating or cooling of foods, since you can change the distribution of your quirk to target certain parts of a container. All you had to do was ask if you wanted me to freeze your slushie again. Of course, that's all dependent on the physical state of whatever you're working with, Midoriya chatters, ignoring Shoto entirely now that he's down his own personal rabbit hole. Obviously, it's going to be easier to cool things down than it is to heat them up, since most containers are at some risk of burning or melting. Glass tends to have a pretty high melting point, but even then, modern borosilica glass can really only withstand up to 500 degrees. Celsius, not Fahrenheit. Maybe a custom-made crucible would be better for that? A crucible's even food safe? Hmm, says Shoto, who is totally not smiling like a goof. And that's just heating. Midoriya waves an errant hand. Cooling wouldn't be nearly as hard unless you're working with a liquid in an easily cracked container. His eyes light up, and depending on the temperature of what you're cooling, it could get really efficient. 
You could boil something in one hand and then freeze it immediately with the other because of the Mpemba effect. Oh, and that trick with the really cold water? You could pour it on a bit of ice and it freezes on the spot? I mean, if you've cooled something down to that level, and then turn on your quirk and stuck your finger inside, you'd probably end up with an ice cube frozen around your finger. He freezes. And in the moment where he meets Shoto's eyes, clearly the exact same thought goes through both of their sleep-deprived brains. Why the hell are they still sitting here when there's science to be done? The moment ends. A slam echoes through the shop, and then the staff and patrons are left speechless, as two teenage boys armed with half-finished drinks and gaping backpacks, rush out the door and into the bright afternoon, not to be seen again without ice cubes frozen around their fingers. They're watching the teachers do physical demonstrations of several hand-to-hand -hand maneuvers in their practical period. Aizawa-sensei pulls off a particularly powerful roundhouse kick. Oh, we stan, says Shoto, just a little bit too loudly. His teacher pauses in the middle of the kick sequence to stare at him balefully, while the class erupts into chaos. The dorm is running out of fresh veggies. The vegetable drawer in the communal fridge is home to three shriveled scallions and very little else. Kartsky unapologetically swipes the last of the romaine lettuce and bell peppers, and grabs the olive oil from the counter while he's at it. He turns around, and standing there is fucking half and half like some silent monolith that decided to take its ugly roots in the kitchen. The hell you want, he says. Aren't you and shitty Deku supposed to be fucking around with your quirk? We're taking a break. Todoroki slips past him, opens the fridge, and takes one egg out of the carton. He's plugging the numbers into the computer so he can graph the data. As he speaks, he washes his left hand, avoiding Katsuki's nudge to get the decent knife from the knife block. I'm just grabbing a snack, he says, shrugging. Pass the oil? Katsuki does not bother to move. Todoroki sighs, leans over and grabs it himself. Thanks anyway, he says, and tips the bottle into his left hand, greasing it like it's a pan, and he's about to tip it in a bowl's worth of cake batter. And then, without any pretense or ceremony, he cracks the egg directly into his open palm, where it begins to sizzle. Kotsky stares at the egg. Stares at half and half. What the fuck? Todoroki stares at him straight in the eye, and has the audacity to say, It's efficient. With his right hand, he takes a pinch of salt and pepper from the spice cabinet, and sprinkles it on top. The chaotic lordling brings the cooked egg straight to his mouth, and with a horrifying slurp, Downs it in one go. He licks his lips clean of yolk, washes his hands in the kitchen sink, and leaves. Just leaves. As if Todoroki didn't violate the Geneva Conventions in front of Kartsky, his salad, and God himself. Kartsky stares at the empty doorway, and then back at the knife and vegetables in front of him on the counter. His jaw is still hanging. Quietly, he puts the knife and vegetables back where they belong, and goes to the common room, where he lies down on the couch with his hands folded over his chest, and regrets coming to UA. Ah, Endeavour-san, Edshot says, in the quiet of the conference room. They're waiting for a briefing to start. What? says Endeavour. Did you know that your son has a Twitter account? Endeavour stares. Edshot coughs and says, It's quite... interesting. Endeavour blinks. Excuse me, restroom, he says, and leaves. Edshot watches him go, and about 30 seconds later, he hears a muffled scream coming from the direction of the men's room. So, Uraka starts amid their notebooks. It's a lazy Sunday afternoon, the heat lulling everyone in a dorm room study session into sleepy procrastination and chatting. Deku wanted to figure out how you could use your quirk to cook food. It sounds pretty simple. Just slap it on your left side and you're good, right? See, there's a problem with that, Shoto starts. If I try and cook things on my left side, he briefly imagines what Endeavor's face would look like if he heard this conversation and snorts. 
If I try to cook things directly on my skin, the body hair is going to get in the way, if not get cooked into the food. Really? I tried it with Kaminari. Didn't work. He's not going to talk about the new bald patch on his left leg. Why not try it on the parts of your body without body hair? Yayozuru says innocently. Izuka claps his hands together and spins around in Uraraka's desk chair. Well, the human body has very limited hairless real estate. Many parts of your body actually have very fine hairs, even if you can't see it. Really, the only truly viable surfaces are the palms of his hands and the bottom of his... All four of their gazes drop down to Shoto's croc-clad feet. Izuku starts wheezing with laughter. Absolutely not, says Shoto. No, but you'd have to... You'd have to grease your foot to... Uraraka makes a honking sound at that. Shoto gives in and absolutely loses at laughing. Foot, he wheezes. Yao Yozuru falls victim to the terminal stupid disease in short order. For the next five minutes, just as they think they're calming down, someone will say, greasy foot, or a whole ass steak on his foot, and then they're back to square one. Shoto's stomach hurts from laughing so hard. Okay, okay, Izuku eventually gasps as they collect themselves. That still doesn't rule out the possibility of using your fire to cook more remotely. Restricting yourself to only your palm. Only your palm, Uraka, please stop. You won't have enough surface area to cook anything bigger than an egg. Wouldn't a grill-like apparatus solve all the problems we've accounted so far? Offers Yaoyazuru. Just put a metal rack over his left side and have him lie down. Wait. Uraka's eyes gleam with a sudden feral light. Are you saying we could have a real barbecue in the dorms together? Oh no, Shoto thinks faintly. She smelled meat. She's tired of being nice. She's about to go ape shit. The fact that smoke is rising from behind the 1A dorm building is, surprisingly, not concerning. Shoto has seen those kids do far worse, and frankly, as long as they don't set off the fire alarm, it's all the same to him. The same cannot be said for Class 1F who struggles to get anything palatable cooked at all. Not for the first time, Shoda is glad that his class is at least competent in the kitchen and can keep themselves fed. If they burn something by accident, chances are it will turn out fine in the end. The concerning part is that the smoke rising from behind the one a door building smells like barbecue. As Shoda approaches the building, it sounds like a barbecue too. The sizzling of a grill, punctuated with the clatter of plates and the chatter of students, Kaminari is laughing far too loudly for comfort. Even more concerning is the fact that non-electric grills, due to fire safety regulations, are banned in the dorms without teacher supervision. Shota steps up to the door. It's unlocked. He briefly considers praying, decides that no god could protect him from his students anyway, and steps in. Immediately, they're screaming. Students startle. Someone dives under the table with a plate of food. Ashido is single-handedly destroying a whole fucking rack of ribs with gusto. Tokiyami is nursing a two-liter bottle of creaming soda. Shinso is sitting on the kitchen counter, cheeks packed like a chipmunk. Hey, sir, he says, or presumably tries, and waves his fork in greeting. Now, you see, this level of chaos would normally not be of note, especially if the kids decided to throw a potluck or communal party. No, Shoto's asking this because of what he sees in the middle of the kitchen. With the windows flung open, you can see it. Motherfucking Toto Shodoroki, in nothing but fireproof boxes, lying on his right side on the floor, fire quirk activated, under a sizzling metal rack of meat. Midoriya is in the middle of tenderly feeding Todoroki pieces of beef from his plate, like a sultan being fed fucking grapes, when Shoto clears his throat. His bone-breaking problem child startles, and stares up at Shoda like an exceptionally gay deer in headlights. Todoroki leans over and bites the meat off the chopsticks, completely uncaring. Shoda is not paid enough for this. What, says Shoda, is happening. Barbecue, the hell children chorus. Kaminari has the audacity to chime in. To be fair, sensei, Grills might be banned at the dorms for fire safety, he turns to Midoriya, but not smoking hot bods. He elbows Shoda's red-faced student. 
Ashida wields her chopsticks like a conductor's baton. You can ban a whole grill, but not a whole Todoroki, she justifies. Expulsion. The term for banning a student is expulsion. Details, details. Shoto closes his eyes and asks God why he must be tormented so. Ida. Yes, sensei? He cracks open his eyes in his most terrifying stare. Explain. Sensei, it is technically not against the rules. All parties involved have done an admirable job in keeping the operation contained and safe. And also, I really wanted some yakiniku. Ida finishes with an uncharacteristic mumble. Shoto sighs. Clearly even the mightiest of teen wills shall fall to the siren call of food. He takes in more details. Sato and Asui appear to be seasoning meat, while Shoji mans the grill. Aoyama flutters about, offering cheese to all who pass by. Ojiro is mixing a dipping sauce. Bakugo is tearing into a steak the size of his own face, much like Shoto imagines a saber-toothed tiger would. The teacher squints at the grill pattern. Is that a fucking handprint on that steak? Well, I had to sear all the meat first, or else the meat juice would just constantly be coming down on me, Todoroki defends. Don't worry, I washed my hands thoroughly. Meat juice, Shoto repeats tonelessly. Also, today is technically Yakiniku Day, Kaminari says. It's great class bonding. So you all decided to use Todoroki's body to... To grill? You know what? Shota's expression suddenly clears up. His face is that of a man given divine relevation. His smile is soft and gentle. This is genuinely disturbing for one A to witness. I give up, he says serenely. He turns around and leaves the way he came with perfect equanimity. They all hear the door close. Present Mike gets out from under the table. I don't think he saw me. Do you guys think he saw me? Nah, Uraka says, mouth already bulging with meat again. You're good. Life-threatening memes for hero student teens. Hashtag general. Easy bake oven. I'm just saying, bath water is technically a broth if the water's hot enough. I can't believe it's not aliens. Sato! <coughs> Stables brand Spider-Man. It's true, but he shouldn't say it. Dot PNG. Costco brand Spider-Man. Okay, but if bath water is a broth, then that means the bath bombs are like those stock cube thingies. You know, like the ones with the weird French name. Sparkle. Bullion. Costco brand Spider-Man. Yeah, what he said. Stan Luna. I hate this fucking family. Spicy hot, icy thought. Why are you bullying me? I'm right. Costco brand Pikachu. Jiro is such a hater. Jiro, stop being a hater. Stan Luna. Kami, I'm about two seconds away from committing war crimes. Spicy hot, icy thought. Anyways, so we've concluded. Bathwater is a broth. Human stock with a bath bomb bullion, if you will. Todoroki, I'm begging you, please stop saying things. No, let him speak. Spicy hot, icy thought. So I have a question for the gamers. Stables brand Spider-Man. Oh no. Does Gamer Girl bathwater qualify as like... Premium human broth? Like Kobe beef, but for bath water? I can't believe it's not aliens. <laughs> Flavoured by the tears of simps! Several people are typing. Hashtag gaming. Costco brand Pikachu. Hey gamers, do you think Shigaraki plays League? Ultimate toxic game. Floaty McFloatface. He's salty enough to. I bet he means Yasuo. Costco brand Pikachu. Keyboard smash. I can't believe I'm not visible. Wait, someone explain this to a non-league pleb. I don't know why this is funny. 
Floaty McFloatface. Everyone hates Yasuo. He's overpowered if he's on the other team, but every time he's on your team, he fails. Okay, Boomer. Only if you're not good enough to pull him off. Costco brand Pikachu. Bet. Okay, Boomer. You want to go, Don's face? I won't believe until I see you do it while you're on my team. Okay, Boomer. Fine. I'll join your fucking team tonight. Costco brand Pikachu. Pog champ. Okay, Boomer. Don't fucking pog at me, you little bitch. Costco brand Pikachu. Aoyama voice. Les Poggers. Sparkle. This is absolutely not funny. Delete this immediately or my lawyer will be in contact. Sparkle Gun PNG. Costco brand Pikachu. This is why gamers are the most oppressed people. Pensive. A man can't even pog. Anyway. What other games do you guys think Shigaraki plays? Small Might. I remember at USJ he kept calling everyone NPCs and stuff. He's definitely a hardcore gamer. I'm thinking Bioshock. I can't believe I'm not visible. Haiki wondering how many controllers he's accidentally destroyed. Target brand Crimson Might. I wonder if he plays Fortnite. Just imagine him Fortnite dancing. I can't believe I'm not visible. Keyboard smash. Sans Fortnite dog gif. Costco brand Pikachu. Hagakure, I would die for you. That gif is perfect. Speaking of Sans, do you think he's played Undertale? Small might. Maybe, if he's an indie game kind of guy. Costco brand Pikachu. I just realized. Todoroki has one blue left eye, just like Sans. The one thing they don't tell you about being a villain is how much of your budget has to be allotted to buying Advil. Now, Darby's not sure if that's an average villainous experience, but it sure fucking is when you're a part of the League of Villains. Take now, for example. What do you mean it's cringe? Undertale's an indie masterpiece and deserves to be judged on its own merits. Shigaraki screeches. Toby Fox's use of the fourth wall as a narrative device of morality was genius. Spinner scoffs. And what kind of leader of the League of Villains only plays true pacifist 100% completion, hmm? Are you a wimp, Shigaraki? Oh, please, Toga says slyly. As if I didn't spot you sobbing after you two accidentally killed Toriel in your first run. Hey, that was supposed to be between me and God. What God? Kurigiri mutters exhaustingly. He motions for Darby's bottle of Advil, who begrudgingly slides it over. God knows the man needs it. Parenting this entire shit fuck catastrophe is his full time job. Besides, even Darby knows that Genocide Route has the best battles. Playing Meclavania in the base might be grounds for free disintegration treatment, but the music still slaps. Elsewhere, Todoroki Shoto is considering a hypothetical cosplay that involves bleaching his red hair. He contacts a certain pro hero, who had DM'd him on Twitter after politely orange justicing with him on national television at the Valor Gala. He asks if Hawks knows anyone who could help him bleach his hair. It does not occur to him that one floor below, Kirishima is soundly sleeping. The sounds of squabbling reach a fever pitch as Spinner takes out his swords and Shigaraki assumes a fighting stance. In the din of shouting, no one notices Darby sneeze. A bottle of quirk-made hair bleach sits on the counter of the dorm bathrooms. Shoto is only wearing shorts and slippers, sitting on a stool. His left hair is sectioned into four tiny ponytails. The person behind him receives a comb and a stony stare. So. His brother makes a pained face in the mirror. Shoto, I said I'm sorry. Bitch, I'll believe it when you finally visit mom. What's it been, a decade? Shoto turns his head to give Toya the most judgmental stare a gay can muster. His brother's shitty scar piercings tug at his skin with how hard Toya is cringing. Fucking hawks. Toya mutters under his breath. And then louder. Okay, I'll visit her later. But for now, I'm just going to do what I came here for and leave. Shoda's villainous accomplice opens the box of bleach and starts getting to work. Very bold of him to assume Shoto's going to let him off the hook that easily. Moving on, Shoto says, 
with no intention of moving on from roasting his older brother. How exactly did Hawks? Don't ask questions if you're not prepared to hear the answer. Like how you shouldn't be leaving the house and cutting ties with all of us if you're not prepared to live as a fucking functional member of society? He fires back without missing a beat. I said, Toya whines, dragging the comb through the current section of hair a little too harshly, that I was sorry, like 15 times already, Shoto. Shoto was no mercy. What was that? I couldn't hear you over the sound of abandonment, Darby. And Fuyumi, did I mention she's going to kill you, by the way? Toya does a full body shudder. Don't remind me. Also, your name is incredibly edgy. Like, Darby? Cremation? Really? It's the name of my fucking quirk. Nato told me you picked out the quirk's name yourself. A fledgling edgelord. A fledgelord? Oh, I should use that one on Togayami. Toya pauses his combing to pinch the bridge of his nose. Under the dorm bathroom lights, he looks a lot less intimidating. How do your classmates even put up with you? I don't remember you being this impudent when you were a child. Oh, I decided to go apeshit a few months ago. I think this is just who I really was, under all the trauma and repression. Onions have layers. I have layers. Did you just quote Shrek at me? Yes, do you have a problem with it? Toya doesn't bother pinching his nose this time. He just sighs, deeply. With surprising grace and familiarity, his brother twists a section of Shoto's hair up and pins it over. Shoto watches the colour slowly leech out of his left hair with vague interest. So, I heard this was so you could cosplay a character? Well, yes. I'm going to cosplay Sans Undertale and terrorise my classmates. Understandably, Toy has to take a moment to process this. Okay, fair. You have one left blue eye. I'll accept this. Sans is cool. His boss battle is good. Shoto blinks. He could, of course, appear to make the rational assumption that Toya has played Undertale. It's not like the League doesn't have money. But is that really the right way to go? When instead he could clown Toya like no tomorrow? He makes a decision. So you're a skeleton fucker, Toya. What? No, Shoto, I don't fuck skeletons. Shoto nods sagely. Yes, because you can't fuck a skeleton. All right, then. He can spot Toya rolling his eyes. Rude. If that's not the case, then how do you know about Undertale? Toya stops combing bleach through his hair. Shoda looks up. Toga, Toya says vacantly, runs a flowy kin blog. Understandably, Shoda has to take a moment to process this. Okay, that tracks, he replies. It does? Yeah, just think about it. Now that I'm thinking about it, I hate how much sense it makes. Me too. Toya takes out another bottle from the plastic bag on the ground and starts applying it. The lifeless bleach side seems to take on a new sheen, achieving the vitality that his right side has. Shigaraki and Spinner won't stop arguing over whether or not Undertale is good. Kurigiri had to put them in time out yesterday. Time out? Darby sprays some quirk-made substance that dries his hair. They're pretty much toddlers in a grown-up body. He has to portal them into their separate rooms and give them video games to play until they calm down. Wow. I know. No, I mean, wow. You did a good job. Shoto stares at himself in the mirror. Without taking his eyes off the glass, he carefully pulls on a blue hoodie completing his black basketball shorts and fuzzy slippers. His left eye seems to burn even brighter than Endeavor's, with the power glinting in his eyes. It's perfect, Shudder breathes. Thank you, Nissan. Anytime, or... Toya coughs very loudly, as if a hairball suddenly got caught in his throat. While his brother is distracted by his allergic reaction to feelings, Shudder smiles widely, just as a certain skeleton might. Terminal Stupid Disease retweeted. Danky, at Chargebone. They keep bullying me! A TikTok video cross-posted onto Twitter from the account at EarphoneJack. Several clips are shown in quick succession. The first shows the camera shakily following Denki Kaminari from behind as he rounds a corner. 
Megalovania begins to play very loudly from the camera as Kaminari screams. Simultaneously, Todoroki Shota comes into view. He is in full sans cosplay and is clearly Fortnite dancing with alarming speed towards the camera. It immediately transitions into the next clip, filmed from the peephole of a door. Kaminari enters the frame and the cameraman snickers. From behind the camera, a muted voice, still foggy with sleep, says, Kyoko, what are you doing? And almost immediately fades into a quiet snore. This, of course, does not last long, as Todoroki seemingly appears out of nowhere, flossing aggressively in the middle of the hallway. The door bursts open in time for Megalovania to start playing, in harmony with Kaminari's screams. The other clips that follow are much of the same vein. The next one appears to be filmed from the hall vents, when all that Jiro plays is the sound of sand speaking. Kaminari jumps, screams, and runs pell-mell down the hall, where he crashes into a pot plant and starts swearing. Another one, where Kaminari is laying face down on the floor in the common room, screaming, Why must you do this to me? As Todoroki, Midoriya Isuku, and Uraka Ochiko circle him. They are all T-posing. Midoriya and Uraka wear sweaters, his done in purple and blue, and hers in green and yellow. The three have plastic dollar store kazoos in their mouth, and are playing, if it can be called that, Megalovania, with impressive harmonies. The final clip is the video filmed in from a doorway. Kaminari is bolting down the hallway, screaming like a loose siren. It takes only a few seconds for a T-posing Todoroki to enter the frame, and less for him to leave it. Midoriya and Uraka, also T-posing, are hot on his heels, with Uraka running upside down across the ceiling. Stan Luna, at Earphone Jack. Get dong dong! Hawks, at Karage Hero. Yo! 2.01am. What? It's 2am. 2.03am. Yeah, but do you want to come perform at the charity concert? It's on the 29th. It's to raise money against heteromorphic quirk discrimination. You sing or do some fancy stuff with your quirk, or dance or whatever. You in? 2.06am. Why me? 2.08 a.m. Listen, you are the centerpiece of the Valor Gala. If you came to this one, you'd be showing support of heteromorphs and simultaneously leveraging your power to bring more attendees to this gala. It's the even playing field concert, so it's open to public with tickets, which is why attendees are important. More money. 2.15 a.m. Alright, I'm down. 2.19 a.m. Oh, good. Miriko said she was going to dip me in batter and fry me at 165 degrees if you weren't. 2.21 a.m. I respect her deeply. 2.21 a.m. Are you sending for Miriko? 2.22 a.m. No, I'm gay. But if I was into women, I'd definitely simp. Actually, no simp implies that she isn't worthy of worship. She's badass as hell. Legitimately a queen. 2.25 a.m. You know what? You were valid. I just told her what you said and she DM'd me a photo of her crying. Tears of joy, I think. 2.26am. On some level I know I should be flipping out that I'm having these conversations with the current number 2 hero and the current number 5 hero, but on the other hand, men who orange justice together stay together. Also, it's past 2am, we should sleep. 2.31am. Okay, fair. Peace. 2.35 a.m. Peace. 2.43 a.m. Now the question is, what does Shudo do at the concert? His first outfit was, sadly, only so effective because it was his public debut as a meme lord. He could theoretically wear the same thing, but what's the fun in that? Plus Ultra, go beyond is the school motto after all. Not only that, he has to put on some kind of performance now. He mulls over exactly how to upstage himself at the concert over studying and training. A few days later, there's a knock on his door. Shodokun? Recognizing the voice, he opens the door, already smiling softly. Hello, Izuku. Izuku's answering smile warms Shodo to the bone. We're having a Disney movie marathon downstairs in about an hour. 
I know you said that you didn't get the chance to watch them, so I was wondering if you'd like to join us. Shoto blinks. I finished all my work early this week, so yeah, I'd like to join. Great. Do you want any snacks? I'm going out on a snack run before we start. Uh, those dipping cracker snacks. Strawberry flavored? The Yen Yens? Yeah, those. Cool. Izuku's eyes crinkle fondly. I'll see you downstairs then. He waves and takes his leave. This is one of the many things that Shoto loves dearly about Izuku. He's always trying to make Shoto comfortable, sometimes at the expense of his own comfort. Shoto almost feels guilty knowing that Izuku is willing to go to the ends of the earth for him, and tries to repay him at every turn possible. He doesn't think he'll be able to match Izuku's unconditional kindness in a million lifetimes, but the beautiful smile he gets is when he gets Izuku a new merch item or a snack from the konbini makes him think that it'll come close someday. It's the little things, he supposes. The last time the class did a movie marathon, Shoto stepped out of his room to grab some water after three hours wrangling an English reading, and was promptly slept into the common room and forcibly sat down by no less than three people. By the time it was over, several of his classmates were crying, and Izuku was curled up against his side, humming merry-go-round of life, and drawing swells of magic into Shoto's palm. He'd dreamed of cat bosses and floating castles and aeroplanes for a week straight afterwards. If this is anything like that, Shoto can't wait. Half an hour later, he wanders down to the first floor, in hot pink sweatpants and a pastel yellow sweater, with cats lovingly soon onto it. The first time he had worn this outfit downstairs, Aizawa had fixed him with the longest stare he'd ever experienced in his life. Now his teacher only sighs a little when he passes by him in the kitchen. He starts the silent electric kettle, and peels the lid of a cup noodle back. The glorious package of MSG-rich sodium-laden powder goes straight in, and dissolves in hot water with a He breathes in the smell of junk food as he carries his dinner to the common room table. Kaminari is already curled up in one of the chairs, charge a cord between his teeth as he powers through a level of plants vs zombies on his phone. Shoto tugs out the chair across from him and sits down to eat. More flavor, Kaminari says, not looking up from his game. Uh, Shoto lifts off the cup to read the label. Soba. They make cups soba? It was a gift. He very deliberately does not mention who gifted it to him. It's not bad. Are you eating it cold or warm? Shoto presses his palm to the underside of the cup and activates his quirk. Kaminari looks up at the tinkling sound. Ice starts to form between the noodles. Shoto extracts it as one large frozen block, sticky from sauce with a light layer of frozen grease on top, and takes a bite. Well, it's cold now, he says. After processing a mouthful of slushy ice shards and crackling soba. Jesus Christ, Kaminari says, with feeling. I shouldn't have come to this school. Hiroshima comes out of the kitchen, happily unaware of Kaminari's distress, and hands Shoto's own steaming cup noodle. Hey bro, you know what to do. Shoto nods, freezes the noodles inside, and tosses them up into the air. Kaminari makes a dying noise as Kirishima jumps up and sinks his sharp-like teeth directly into the frozen block of grease, noodles, and MSG, like a dog catching a frisbee. Dinner is served, Shoto says, with a slight smile, and savors his own flavor block. What Kaminari doesn't know is that Shoto can melt it back into palatable and cool instant sara noodle into his mouth, but Kaminari doesn't need to know that. Shoto slurps down his noodles in what should be an impossibly fast time for a block of ice, ignores Kaminari's awed and terrified stare, and washes his hands. Shinzo rises from the dead over on the couch, stares at Shoto's smug expression for 0.2 seconds, before dumping himself into the chair next to Kaminari and diving into his lap. Itoshi, Kaminari whines. You just missed a war crime being committed in front of me. Mm-hmm. The zombies just ate your brain, by the way. Shinso supplies helpfully. It's Hoshi, Kaminari says, with the cadence of a preschool tattletale. He froze his cup noodles into a block of ice.
and ate it like that. He's already been doing that for Kirishima on a regular basis. God, I thought I was having a fever dream when I saw that. He just jumped up, right? Kaminari gesticulates. Like a dog, he says, and then buries his hand into Shinzo's hair. He closes his tired eyes. Shoto smiles at their banter and moves to the sofa area, tossing out the empty cup on his way out. Sprawled out over the sofas are his classmates, friends, really, relaxing in a mishmash of pajamas and sweatpants on a Friday evening before another weekend grind. Blankets of snacks dot the small coffee tables next to the sofas, bean bags, and the futons dragged from people's own closets. There isn't a single spot of hard floor that Shoto can see among the pillows and blankets. Sarah's laptop is hooked up to the huge TV with a cable, showing his Netflix home screen. Ashido is snoring loudly, one hand over her eyes, as Akakure doodles a very tiny penis on each of her fingernails in blue sharpie. Tsuyu is bundled in the same fluffy plink blanket as Uraka, sat together on the couch like a particularly large and cute piece of sakura mochi. Koda is letting his rabbit play nearby, where Ujiro is batting a ball back and forth with the rabbit using his tail. Oi, Todoroki! Kaminari waves at him from where he's attached to a very begrudging Bakugo like a koala. Or a barnacle. There's a spot next to Midoriya. Go sit. He then winks very obviously as Bakugo growls something about shitty fucking Deku and shitty fucking Icy Hot. Any suggestions for the first movie? Jiro asks, nestled into and looking very content in Yayozuru's lap. I'm taking votes for everything except Cars and anything in the Cars cinematic universe. She throws a glare at Tokuyami. That also means planes and fire and rescue. Do not give me that bullshit again. Tokuyami puts his hand down. Votes are thrown around, and all Shoto can do is watch helplessly as his friends, his friends, bicker lovingly over whether the live action of Hercules could ever hold a candle to the original. Sato sings a line about You're Welcome, which gives a round of surprised applause from all around. Aoyama and Uraraka debate over whether The Great Fairy Rescue or Secret of the Wings was the better Tinkerbell movie, until Shoji instantly starts them up with, Obviously The Lost Treasure was better, y'all just don't appreciate Terence enough. It's cozy. Shoto hasn't felt this comfortable in a long, long time. Most of his formative years were spent wondering when the fuck he'd get away from his father's influence. After coming to UA and moving into the dorms, it was like he lost his roots altogether, a stranger no matter where he was. Up until very recently, he didn't really feel like he had a home, one that he belonged to and one that belonged to him. Now, with Izuku leaning on his shoulder and stealing yan yans when he thinks Shoto isn't looking, Shoto thinks he's found a home for himself right here, in this chaotic clusterfuck of fuzzy slippers and spilled chips and spilling laughter. Jiro eventually calms the furious debate on what to watch, and riddles it down to a still hefty list of movies. Sarah cues everything up in his laptop, and hits play as everyone settles in. A few hours later, Shoto is completely absorbed in last year's remaster of Frozen. I'm never going back, Elsa belts. The past is in the past. It's as though he's discovering the shirt all over again this time complete with a Grammy-winning soundtrack. Frost crawls up his back, crossing the bridge of his shoulders and onto the fireside of his body, spiraling in frozen fractals through his nerves. I am seen, it says, and I am heard, and I exist, and this is who I am. In that moment, armed with the shirt, and with God and anime, Disney, on his side, Shoto's third eye opens, and he sees all. The cosmic universe frog croaks divine wisdom directly into his mortal ear once more, and he is replete with knowledge. The moment passes, but Shoto's inspiration remains. Quietly, he looks around at the others. Everyone is perfectly enraptured in the movie. No one is watching. He gently grasps Izuku's wrist. Izuku startles slightly, and then looks at Shoto with fond confusion. His heart swells as he moves his hands to cradle Izuku's face, and sees him lean forward, wide-eyed with hope. Thank you.
Shoto whispers, for inviting me here, and then kisses him square on the lips. Life-threatening memes for hero student teens. Hashtag general. Stan Luna. Best genius just got on stage, LMAO. Holy fuck, he's got a guitar. I'm hyped. Never mind, post cancelled. He sucks. Poor Rick. What a mad banquet of darkness. His voice seems to be refined, though. Stan Luna. His wrist looks like it's going to snap in half. He doesn't deserve rights. I can't believe it's not aliens. F. Stan Luna. Thank God he's leaving. I was about to tape a stick to his wrist. He may be the number three hero, but he's got the shittest grip on that guitar I've ever seen. Costco brand Pikachu. Wait, where are you right now? Stan Luna. Even playing field concert. The thing where a ton of heroes and celebrities go on stage and perform shit, sing, play music for charity against heteromorphic discrimination. It's a very sexy and awesome thing to do. The hero celeb singers always get the biggest reactions because they're either hilariously bad or jaw-droppingly amazing there and there's no in between. You can pass on that and do flashy aesthetic stuff with your quirk, but only the singing grabs so many tickets. So far, the best singer was weirdly wash. Costco brand Pikachu. Wig. Stan Luna. Here with me suffering is resident Poe wannabe. Poor Rorick. Hawks insisted I intend, though I can't fathom why. I do appreciate it, though. Takoyaki. Well, you are his intern, and you have a heteromorphic quirk. I couldn't come this year, but I try to at least watch it every year. It's nice to know people care about us. Real Life Disney Princess. I'm glad, too, especially since they feature a lot of heteromorph musicians that don't normally get the spotlight. Kettle. Heteromorph Squad. Curious George, heteromorph squad. I swear to God, if someone touches my tail without asking again, I will lose it. Warm up Miranda Ray's ahead. Fuck, I forgot to meet you before my nap. Mute. Oh, sick. Wait, let me join the broadcast. I forgot this was today. Ingenium. We're playing it on the TV in the common room, Shinzo-kun. Feel free to join us. Smile. Stan Luna. I don't know how they rigged the cameras, but there's a bunch of them floating around. How are they not crashing into each other? Also, damn, the skill of this octopus quirk guy on the piano. His phrasing is flawless. Stables brand Spider-Man. If, parentheses, going to crash into each other, parentheses, parentheses, don't, parentheses, parentheses, semicolon, parentheses. Floaty McFloat face. I could probably get the cameras in the air, but they'd all crash. Small Mite. A quirk based on centripetal motion could probably do the job. Pushing that, I've heard of people with puppeteer quirks, but it would take a lot of work to prevent wind-ups. Easy May Govern. At Stan Luna. Kyoko darling, I hope you're ready for the next performance. Stan Luna. Question mark? Babe, what? Easy May Govern. Smiley face. As they say, you know reverse card, my love. Stan Luna. Wait, what? Wait. Poor Yorick. What on earth? Stan Luna. Why the fuck is Todoroki on stage? What? What is he wearing? Several people are typing. The opening piano lines to let it go ring out to the stadium. A thunderous roar ripples through the audience as Todoroki walks on stage, clad in Elsa's first teal and black gown. A beautiful purple cape ripples behind him, and a delicate rendition of her crown glitters on his head, made entirely of Todoroki's own eyes. Yuga sparkles with joy backstage at the glorious design. Many hours spent poring over his first real fashion commission, adding personal touches to the embroidery, painstakingly stitching on hundreds if not thousands of rhinestones. He deserves to be proud. He had hijacked Sarah's Netflix subscription for a week straight, getting stills in Elsa's grounds in the highest definition possible, and then did it again the next week to study watch several documentaries on Dior's ateliers and creative process. His final creation is his own adaptation of her gown, uniquely patterned for Todoroki-kun. 
Beside him, Yao Yozuru stands with her hands crossed over her chest, looking smug and purposely ignoring the onslaught of messages rattling her phone. Her part in this chaos is equally important. She provided the rhinestones, helped swatch fabric colors, and replaced parts in Yuga's sewing machine when they broke. It was really thanks to her vigilance that he got away with doing this in the dorm without being discovered in the first place. And of course, Todoroki positively glimmers. He'd been watching the Broadway adaptation of Frozen at breakfast when he saw the glory of the dress transition. How they'd pull it back off and then... quirks? Research told him the dress was a tearaway, but after recruiting Yao Yozuru, they had access to a very particular fabric that would make the dramatics that much more effective. Out of sheer necessity, Yuka had made Todoroki learn how to sue two weeks before the concert. He hasn't slept in nearly two days. His fingers are probably bleeding. He doesn't care. He's fabulous. Yuga watches Todoroki lift the microphone to his lips and begin to sing. Stan Luna. What on God's green earth? Poor Yorick. I had no idea Todoroki was so gifted at singing. Jesus. Small mite. My boyfriend is so good and talented at singing. I'm actually going to show her when you see this. I love you. Floaty McFloat face. Boyfriend? Deku, wait. Hold up. I can't believe it's not aliens. Wait. Costco brand Pikachu. What? Target brand Crimson Riot. Boyfriend? Costco brand Pikachu. At Small Might. At Spicy Hot Icy Thought. Explain yourselves? Target brand Crimson Riot. Congratulations, you two! Easy Bake Oven. What? Target brand Crimson Riot. You're so manly! Easy Bake Oven. I leave for one second to check my batch of cookies, and Todoroki is singing Let It Go on stage, and Midoriya is apparently dating him. Ingenium. Do not message Midoriya at this time. He appears to be very emotional and will not be able to respond to your inquiries. He likely revealed this information in the throes of his emotional outburst, and I ask that you respect his privacy at this time. Small Might. No, it's okay, Ida. I love him too. Curious George. They're dating? Wait, I thought they were just... Small Might. So much! Curious George. The densest pair of hopeless idiots. Christ, Midoriya's in hysterics. I can't believe I'm not visible. What the fuck is going on here? Small Might. I need people to know that he's good and I love him. Okay, Boomer. Icy Heart? Motherfucking Icy Heart? Rick rolling piece of shit Icy Heart? I can't believe it's not aliens. Wait, Todoroki Rick rolled you? Okay, Boomer. Jesus Christ, Deku. Shut up, Ashido. I can't believe it's not aliens. Midoriya, you chose well. Small mite. I know. Floaty McFloatface. Wow, Todoroki's really getting into the lyrics. Who the fuck told him how to sing? Why does he sound so good? Stan Luna. His voice is incredible. His tone is so good. If he didn't take lessons, I'm actually going to lose it. All is quiet in the Todoroki household. Shoto's in the dorms, no doubt inventing new methods of disrespecting his father's authority. Fiumi said she was going out with a few co-workers, but Angie saw the notifications in her phone that very clearly said, pick up Natsuo and visit mum. The fridge is almost as empty as the house, but Angie grabs a beer from the back. It barely even fizzes when he cracks it open with a spoon, which just goes to show how long it's been sitting there. He sinks into the worn cushion in front of the television. Sighs and takes a swig of his flat beer. It's too quiet in the house. Once, and you would have hated the sound of little feet pattering across the tatami and the squeals of too many children. Now he just wants to hear something other than the wind rattling raised chimes at the door. 
and she picks up the remote. Not much you can do about that now. He turns on the television. He stares at the broadcast of his son. Let it go, Shoto sings. Let it go, can't hold it back anymore. He can't stop smiling. The entire crowd is singing with him. The glint of thousands of phone lights swaying back and forth in time with the music makes brightness swell in his chest. Let it go. He summons a glittering flare of snow at his right. Let it go. A gout of sparks burst over the audience to his left. And turn away and slam the door. He stares straight into the camera. He addresses this one straight to his shitty old man, whether he's watching or not. I don't care what they're going to say. Let the storm rage on. He grins sharply, victoriously. The cold never bothered me anyway. Shoto muses about how much his time at UA has changed him as he sings. The school that was supposed to be yet another shackle of his father's vision instead afforded him with freedom that he could have never dreamed of. Midoriya, all the new friends he made, all the support and laughter and cursed barbecue that they shared, and memes and thrift store t-shirts. His experiences broke the fears that once controlled him, tested the limits and broke the internet, and made Shoto freer than he'd ever been in his life. The twin jets of his quirk flurry through the air, and he declares with wild happiness, I'm never going back, the past is in the past. He slams his left foot on the ground, and flames burst under his heel. The heat-sensitive fabric of his dress flares to life, the black and teal turning into a bright turquoise, rising like the break of dawn. At the peak of the song, he reaches skyward, unfurling his arms gracefully, as Momo instructed him, into the burst of fire that tosses his hair in every direction, leaving him backlit in the flames on the frozen stage. Long gone is the perfect son of Endeavor. Shoto lets go. Here I stand, he cries, in the light of day, let the storm rage on. The music quiets, and he laughs a little into the mic. The cold never bothered me anyway. The crowd explodes with noise. He thinks he can spot Jiro and Tokuyami somewhere a bit to the back and left. He gestures backstage. Momo and Aoyama stride forward, confident and proud with their work. The designers, he yells into the mic. Give them a round of applause. The crowd, incredibly, gets louder. Somewhere in the back, Hawks is weeping loudly with a fried chicken pride, while Miracle leads an encore cheer among the crowd. Shoto has never felt more jubilant in his life. He laughs openly and loudly and the three of them bow to the crowd before striding off stage. And she turns the television off. He gets up, goes upstairs, and lies on the bed with his hands folded over his chest, and regrets every decision he's ever made. Period. <laughs>